Welcome to the Ottawa Business Journal's live broadcast of Bringing Ottawa's Downtown Back to Life. I'm Michael Curran from the Ottawa Business Journal. Thank you for joining us in such great numbers today. Uh, we have had lots of interest in today's show. We're broadcasting live on YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. Uh, many of the city's business leaders are joining us today and we appreciate their time. Before we get into today's uh, important topic, a bit of background. Uh, this live broadcast is part of a larger project called Best Offices Ottawa. The project was started back in 2015, way before the pre-pandemic disrupted uh, office use. And the project has one simple goal when it was founded. It, it is to recognize aesthetically beautiful, functional, and healthy offices. These days, Best Offices includes a glossy magazine that's due out this fall, so keep your eyes open, and this podcast series. And over the past couple of years, we've done several podcasts with today's presenting sponsor, Bureau Vision. In fact, let's take a look and remind you of some of what we've talked about. Uh, first off, we've had uh, design trends for today's workplace. That was uh, uh, done a few months back. Uh, also, tips to transform today's post-pandemic office, and also how to optimize your return to office. Uh, a reminder that all of those videos can be viewed on OBJ's YouTube channel. Just look for the Best Offices Ottawa Play, playlist. So what does Best Ottawa Offices have in common with the future of downtown? I would argue a lot. In fact, maybe we could agree that aesthetically beautiful, functional, and healthy offices are more important than ever. When we were planning this episode, uh, our guest from Eurovision came up with this inspired idea to broaden our focus and focus on bringing Ottawa's back town, uh, uh, bringing Ottawa's downtown back to life. Let's meet her now. Our guest, our first guest, and our sponsor. Here is the president of Bureau Vision Ottawa, Jillian Oxley Harper. Hello, hey. Jillian. Hey, Michael. How are you? So nice to see you again. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm very uh, glad to be with you uh, today. And uh, what a wonderful evolution, Jillian, in what we've been doing over all of these episodes. You know, if I think about it, we've been very focused on the inside of what happens to the offices. Today, we're quite literally broadening uh, our focus to include all of downtown Ottawa. And maybe I'll start there, Jillian. Why did you think this is an important topic? Uh, typically, again, we've been talking about like interior design and aesthetics, but you wanted to do something with yeah. a much bigger scope. Why, why is that, Jillian? We wanted, we wanted to do something we felt we needed to do. Um, you know, the past webinars have, have illustrated our belief, as you said so well, creating workspaces where people want to be, where it encourages collaboration and strategy and creativity. But we also have recognized, I think, in every webinar that we've done, that hybrid has a place and that hybrid is here to stay. Yeah. But if you have hybrid, you need an alternate home. And that home is, the, is your office, and ideally it's downtown. People need to be with people. They need to be around other people. It's it's not just part of your work experience. It's part of, I think, your health experience. And, you know, the great part of having a downtown location is that it really does pull together all the pieces or the fabrics of our, of our the different fabrics of our lives. And, you know, that can be our work life. That can be our social life. When you look at the wonderful restaurants and and pubs and just dining experiences downtown it can be our cultural life when you look at the arts and you look at theater and you look at the different events that are brought in to the hub of our city and it, it also touches upon the 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 retail experiences all the beautiful shops all the beautiful things we can do downtown and it really when we're downtown it aligns us and it allows us to support all the entrepreneurs who have invested in their businesses to support us and to create that wonderful experience. At Bureau Vision, we strongly, strongly believe in, in a downtown core. In fact, when um, my partners started Bureau Vision Ottawa in 2015, there was no question. We're located downtown in Montreal and we located in downtown in Ottawa. So it's right off of Spark Street. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And I'll speak a little bit more about that space on Spark Street at the end. I think really our goal with this with this session today was to let people hear about 
downtown, how it can be rebuilt, why it needs to be rebuilt. And the three um, panels on the members that agreed to join us, I think will speak very eloquently and passionately about that. Wonderful. Well, thank you for teeing up the beginning of today's show. We're going to see you in about 15 minutes, Jillian. So uh, okay. I'll bid you adieu at this time. Okay. And uh, for our viewers, uh, I'm going to give you a preview of what's going to happen today. We're taking uh, today's show in kind of two parts. Uh, the first part will be advocating for a new vision for downtown Ottawa. We'll launch into that in about 30 seconds or so. And in part two, we'll be talking about uh, and examining some of the real estate and related issues. Uh, at the end of both of those parts, we'll be looking for your input. So if you're on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, or Twitter, there is an ability to comment on the live stream. And we'll be looking for your questions. And we hope to make today a real interactive session. We've got some great panelists. So please chime in, share your opinion, share your questions. All right, we're going to launch right into uh, part one now, which again is advocating for a new vision for uh, downtown Ottawa. And we know this has been a topic that's been talked about and will likely be talked about for many months and years to come. We've assembled two of the city's biggest advocates for downtown Ottawa. I'm going to introduce them now. First up, we have Su Ling Ching, the president and CEO of the Ottawa Board of Trade and a task force member. Hello, Su Ling. Great to see you. Hi, Michael. And we also have Neil Mahotra, who is the vice president of Claridge Homes, uh, celebrating a LinkedIn anniversary, I'm, I'm told. Uh, uh, but you're also, Neil, uh, pertinent to this discussion, uh, the downtown, the chair, the co-chair of the Downtown Ottawa Revitalization Task Force. Thank you both for joining us here today. Uh, so, Ling, I'm going to start with you. Um, again, we've had some discussions about this. Uh, so, Ling, we, in fact, we had a whole summit uh, a few uh, weeks ago devoted to this. But maybe you can reiterate once again why you feel, and you're so eloquent when you speak to this, why you feel the downtown is something that demands our attention right now. Mm -hmm. Well, firstly, thank you for inviting me to uh, speak about this. We've been talking a lot about it um, uh, since the pandemic about the downtown and, and we know that our downtown and downtowns in large cities all across Canada were disproportionately impacted by the countermeasures of, of the pandemic. And the downtown in all of our cities um, is the heart and soul of our cities. It's a um, it's the center of our economy, of our culture, of our community, and uh, particularly with Ottawa, we have such a one quarter of our um, office workers were in the core pre-pandemic and over half of that was public sector. So we have such a large footprint of the public sector here that it's made it more difficult for us in Ottawa uh, to look at the return to office and how that can impact our economy. So, and why that's important is because uh, we have so many businesses that have been built up all through the years around that 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 district. Um, but also in Ottawa, it's a big part of the assets that we have for the visitor economy, which not only is a huge economic driver for us, and uh, also is the front door to every other form of economic development, because people may come here to visit for a conference or to see the parliament buildings or to visit one of our museums. And then they may think of Ottawa to return to visit or to or to move here, be an entrepreneur here, go to school here or invest here. So so uh, really, the economy uh, is really uh, centered in our downtown, and it affects every area of our city, but also our entire region. I, I think that's well said. It's it's not just uh, another area of the city, another neighborhood. Mm -hmm. It really is kind of that foundational uh, item. Neil, I want to bring you into the discussion. Um, you've been working as co-chair, along with Yasser Nakfi, by the way, on something called the Downtown Ottawa Revitalization Task Force. Can you give us um, a little bit of background about why that was created, but equally important, kind of give us an update on what you've been working on in the past several months? Sure, sure, yeah. Um, the task force was created. I mean, these, these problems became very evident, obviously, in uh, post as we we're coming out of post-pandemic times, and the reality of, of hybrid work and work to home uh, was was going to be a challenge. So, so uh, yeah, sir, showed a great deal of leadership in trying to bring a diverse group of people together to to deal with the topics. Um, you know, I think initially. 
the focus would be about, you know, what are we going to do with these office buildings if they all stay empty? Um, but, you know, there's a great, great set of issues. I think, you know, they're, they're prevalent. You, uh, you go to the eyeball test with social issues downtown uh, have existed a little bit prior to the pandemic and have been magnified a little bit. And, and, and whether you look at it as homelessness or, or uh, mental health issues or drug addiction, um, you know, there's, there's some signif significant issues that are, are hampering uh, our downtown moving forward and uh, trying to bring some people together and discuss those issues and, and solutions was a great idea at the time. Uh, the task force has been consulting with the public over the past year, along with uh, several uh, uh, subject matter experts uh, on these topics. And, you know, I think our, our goal right now, uh, multi-phased public consultation has just wrapped up. Um, and I think we'll see some recommendations starting to come from the task force, uh, uh, hopefully uh, in late June. And I'm not going to ask you to scoop yourself. I appreciate you're going to wait till the uh, the release of the report. But maybe uh, in the next few minutes, Su Ling and Neil, we can talk about uh, not some of the problems, but really some of the options. Maybe I can put it that way. And maybe I'll start with you, uh, Neil, then we'll come back to Su Ling. So uh, there's been a lot of input that has been received. I know there's been some research done. It is a multifaceted problem. It's complex. But Neil, do you have any sense of where we can go to move ahead? Well, I, you know, I think it's it's important to understand the economic challenge first. Um, with with uh, a hybrid schedule, uh, particularly with with the public service, it's roughly forty or fifty thousand people a typical day missing from the downtown core on average. It's obviously less so Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Monday, Fridays. You could definitely notice. The difference in traffic that's a significant economic impact to solve uh particularly for small business that that uh whether they rely on specifically the, the the workers or the residents of the neighborhood it's just a large number of people missing our our retail is sized to that our restaurants are sized to that um you know so that that's the economic hole that needs to be filled you know at the end of the day the only solution is obviously you need other people to replace it uh you can put that into basically three categories. We're going to have residents, we're going to have the the day population of workers, and we got tourists. And so, ultimately, uh, the three levels of government and the community need to figure out how how do we replace those people in the community. Um, you know, the obvious answer is, hey, you go change all these office buildings into residential places and have people move into them, but. You know, the, the reality, you know, particularly from where I come from, we're, we only move a couple thousand people a year into downtown Ottawa, historically, uh, pre-pandemic. It, it, it's, uh, it's not Toronto where there was 30, 40,000, 50,000 condominium units being put up in the downtown core. It, it, the best year in Ottawa, there was maybe 2,000 condos being put up in the last 10 years. And, and it's been, you know, more like 1,000 is really the, the average. Um, in the residential standpoint, we have seen an increase in in kind of purpose built rental construction. But let's be honest, with the current interest rate environment, that's that's starting to slow down. Um, so, so it's not going to be just residential development, and it, and and it's not going to be just changing office buildings into residential because that's actually a very complicated, tough process. There are limited buildings that actually physically are even capable of it. Uh, uh, office buildings are just designed very differently than residential buildings. They're not, they're typically developed as much bigger buildings, which does not make it very easy to turn into residential buildings because residential buildings need window exposure uh, and, and daylight. Uh, not, not just from a functional standpoint, but actually from a building code standpoint. So there's some significant technical issues. Uh, and then, you know, the, the, other, the other part you got to boost is tourism. You know, what can we do to increase tourism in the city to help to fill that? And, and, um, you know, I think all levels of government are gonna have to put their head to it on what, what are those things we can put that, that attract people to come downtown more often Monday to Friday. Um, what's evident in this city, you know, you just have to look at race weekend this past weekend, you know, it brings people downtown and that's great for Saturdays and Sundays. Um, but how, do, how do we do that Monday, Monday to Friday? Because quite frankly, there, there aren't too many businesses that can survive on two out of seven days of good business. Right. Businesses are striving to be seven days, if possible, busy, but at least five is important. 
Absolutely. And Suling, you've you've spent considerable time on this issue too. You've talked to experts like Mary Rowe. When you think of uh, the coming years, what are some of the options you think we should be uh, delving into a little bit more at this point? Well, <clears throat> um, Neil's quite right. We have to look at our downtown as a place that will attract people for all different kinds of reasons. And, uh, and you know, the pandemic has put us in a position where we were trying to uh, figure out what the long-term impacts will be. And I think we all know, obviously, hybrid and the disposal of the uh, federal assets in the downtown are going to impact us. So we need to have a really clear understanding of what that means and um, and look at a multifaceted approach, if you, as you have said. So we really believe that there's all levels of government, yes, but that we all have a stewardship role to play in the downtown. You know, our ability to continue to support local, to communicate how important it is and, and, and have people coming to Ottawa. Um, so there's short and long-term strategies. Um, and then there's strategies that are simple, like animation, like the race this last weekend, and how many more of those kinds of things can we uh, can we put on and, and support and invest in to, to bring people to Ottawa so they can see how fabulous it is, uh, but also long-term strategies, including infrastructure. Conversions is one option. Uh, conversions, not just to residential, but, you know, other opportunities to bring other types of businesses into the core. So it has to be sort of a multi-pronged approach where we're looking at um, how can we invest in employment, in infrastructure, um, and then have people living, working, and playing downtown as well? It, Suling, I'll, I'll stay with you for a second here. One of your favorite phrases uh, that I like is radical collaboration. Mm -hmm. And I, I think, as you've indicated before, we had that during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, but we're going to need that again for the downtown because th this, again, just to underline, will be a multi multifaceted issue that will need the federal government, provincial, NCC, city government, mm -hmm. uh, Ottawa tourism, boards of trades, private sector players, uh, festivals, so on and so forth. Are you confident that everyone uh, appreciates what we're facing here from, from a potential risk point of view? Um, you know, Michael, you and I started talking about this over two years ago when we first brought Mary from the Canadian Urban Institute to Ottawa for our Ottawa Economic Outlook. And, you know, at that point, she was starting to signal we need to be moving, we need to be taking action. And I think now people are starting to see that we have to be assertive, that we have to prioritize progress over perfection, and that it has to be an all hands on deck. So I do see how people are starting to understand why it's important for the whole city and the entire uh, nation, national capital region for us to have a thriving downtown for sure. Neil, let, let's come back to you. I, th you know, I think one of the reasons why you're on the task force is because of this remarkable expertise in residential that, uh, that you and uh, bring to the table along with Claridge. Um, I heard you loud and clear that residential, converting commercial buildings into residential is way more complicated than people think. And in many cases, the buildings simply cannot be converted. Um, I'm wondering, Neil, if we need, uh, if private sector developers such as Claridge and your and your peers need some level of um, uh, incentive to be looking at the suitable buildings, uh, is that something that uh, you would advocate uh, for, Neil? Um, so I, I would, at this moment, I actually would personally advocate we we probably need incentives for all types of residential okay. downtown. Not just not just conversion, uh, not just affordable housing. We costs and demands are in a place where it is going to need some help. Uh, you know, a year ago the city was going in the direction it was actually becoming the most expensive place to develop with the highest um, burdens to the city. Uh, we're, we're coming into the downtown areas, particularly at transit stations. Some of that's been corrected, but. There, there's a need for a lot of things to happen. Uh, and it's going to be very careful not to just get caught up in one thing. What, one, of, one of the interesting things in Ottawa is essentially pre-pandemic, there was actually four or five building conversions that occurred of office yeah. buildings to, to residential where market conditions worked. And, and you know, and then that was a factor of, of you know, essentially there's certain types of buildings that, that the feds were no longer continuing with and they they had some of the qualities that allowed them to be converted easily typically there were smaller buildings essentially 
so that was kind of happening with the market anyways. Uh, and, and there's at least four or five examples of where, where that's occurred in the city in, in the last five years. Um, but we need to get a higher velocity of people living downtown. And, and we need to, you know, downtown is considered the most expensive place to live in the city. Um, it needs to be a relative option that it's, it's not actually the most expensive place in the city uh, for units to be developed going forward because the, the natural draw for people to live downtown was to be living close to work. Hmm. And if you're going to work at home, it's just as easy to live at your cottage up at the big Rito. Um, and that, that's a reality. And, and the patterns of growth in the communities around Ottawa, like Kempville and Rockland and Carlton place, I've shown people are going further away and, and, and uh, you know, whether it was they wanted more space for out of safety during the pandemic, whatever, people started getting away from living in the city and say, hey, I want a quieter lifestyle and, and, and affordability became a big part of that as well. I can have, you know, for the price of living in a two bedroom condominium downtown, I can live on three acres in Renfrew. And, and lots more people were making, starting to make that choice. Um, so, so we, we, there's, there's, there's going to need to be some thinking about how we get more people choosing to live downtown. And, and part of that's economic and part of it, some of the other stuff and improving um, lifestyle downtown and having, having more draws that you just want to be around downtown five days a week because it's, it is lively and it's exciting and it's, it's it really is a lifestyle decision. I agree 100%. And, and and I think what people need to be careful about is is the tipping point, right? That we don't reach that tipping point where the incentive to live downtown, whether it's quality of life or closeness to, you know, various cultural and and other types of activities uh, doesn't diminish. Um, we're we're going to start wrapping up. We still have a few minutes here, uh, Su Ling and Neil, but maybe maybe I'll ask, uh, come back to you, Su Ling, and ask, um, is there is there one next step that you think we should take or one reason to feel optimistic in this? Because often when I'm having this discussion, I'm just seeing barrier, 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 barrier. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but you know, we can't limit ourselves to that, that type of thinking. We can't uh, be in this kind of uh, uh, paralysis by analysis type stage. So what's a next step we should take, Su Ling, or, mm -hmm. or what's something that makes you optimistic? And Neil, I'll ask you the same question in a second. Maybe Neil should answer first. <laughs> uh oh, no. we're in trouble. <laughs> so, so I I do feel as though it doesn't do us any good to keep focusing on what the barriers are, that to look yeah. at them as opportunities. And the truth is, is that we do have an opportunity in Ottawa to transform our downtown in a way that we would never have even contemplated doing pre-pandemic. Um, and and we you know we had this sort of this uh, what do you call that like that one horse pony show or something yeah, yeah. Uh, where we rely so much on the public sector. And so, and, and so that also puts us at risk as it has done now, right? Which we, we didn't anticipate and we would never have been forced to revisit. So we have a tremendous amount of strengths in our downtown core. We have so many amenities being in the nation's capital. I think that I'm optimistic that we are now trying uh to work together to understand what the future could look like and um, how the nation's capital could transform. I think that's exciting. I think if we build on the strengths that we have and then look at new opportunities, collaboration is the key. Having a plan is a key that everybody can, uh, you know, see the vision and see their part in it, including the community and every level of government. So um, I do believe we need to create some momentum to keep the positivity going, to build some confidence in, in the market so that our businesses, our entrepreneurs, our developers uh, see Ottawa and the future that it has the potential to be. You know, I think it's a brilliant point because, you um, uh, as we know in business, you know, every challenge is an opportunity. And it's quite funny, as you pointed out, that, you know, for decades we would have said our downtown is so stable because we have all these public sector workers and they mm -hmm. really provide a, a, an economic foundation. And now that kind of became a, a little bit of an Achilles heel. But I do think you're right, Su Ling. Like it, it is a, a, if we're brave about this, uh, it is an opportunity to forge a new vision mm -hmm. and build a better city. Mm -hmm. And at our very first task force meeting, Neil is the one that educated me that it wasn't all perfect pre-pandemic either. 100%. And, so, and that so we could be looking at a 24-7 vibrancy that maybe we didn't have before. 
Absolutely. And Neil, I'll come to you. And by, by the way, I'll point out, in our, we are getting some comments in, and people are making that comment that downtown had problems before the pandemic and, and the sidewalks were rolling up at five o'clock. You know, I always think there's a little room for to debate that. But Neil, let's come back to you. So what's one next step? I mean, we, we're going to see the task force uh, issue a little bit of a report, but when's, what's uh, a next step? And what's one reason to be optimistic here, here Neil? Please give us a reason. Well, listen, I, I, I think there's some really interesting things bubbling around town, some of them uh, quite public right now and, and some not so public. And there's interest in people making some significant investment in this city. I, I think we've got to figure out how to get some of those things done. There's no, even on the tourism side, there's no like one magic bullet. Like, no. you know, we, I'll use the example of like, you know, if an event center comes to La Breton Flats, it's it's a piece of the puzzle, but but there's multiple pieces that that need to be done, and so hopefully some of those investments can can move forward in, in a really positive fashion and and not get caught up in red tape and whatever else, and think those things move forward, and those will be the starts, and you know more reinvestment at Lansdowne, and and some of these things that are, are there, those are some pieces, the opening of the library, mm -hmm. you know, confident eventually the LRT, you know. Is a, is a functional asset for the city and, and something people have have trust in. And, and and all those all those bits and pieces will start to contribute and 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 you know really you know our 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 easy win, you know, I think for the city is to get the people from the suburbs to start enjoying the downtown core more and, and start mm -hmm. using it more, right? There's there's a million people that live on the perimeter of downtown that you know, need to get back in the habit of, of coming downtown and, and want to, they're just waiting for those reasons to, to, to come back downtown. So I, I think those, that's really going to be the short-term win is, is getting a few things that just bring people from across the city and the region coming downtown on a more regular basis and not just, just special events, but just sort of make a habit of doing it again. Yeah. Um, one quick comment uh, from you, uh, one follow-up for you, Neil, and then, then we'll wrap up here and I'm not looking to put you on the spot, but you, you did mention Le Breton. I was debating in my head whether to bring it. So we're not going to get into who owns the senators or that type of stuff, but let's just imagine there's a, there's an event center on Le Breton. Let's hope, imagine, let's hope. How important on a scale of one to 10, for example, Neil, do you think that is in terms of the new vision of downtown? Is, is that a massively important component that we get that right? Um, I think, I, like I said, I think I'd phrase it as, I think we need two or three things okay, like that to start filling in those gaps for people. And th those are like the short term wins because it sort of come back to like, we're not going to double the popu residential population of downtown tomorrow. In fact, if you, the history of center town, you know, it's only about 10 years ago we got back to the population that existed in the 70s in center town. Okay? Like it's 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 been declining. That's that's a that's a factor of aging demographic in that neighborhood. People's kids leave, the families leave and you know, you've got one or two people living in in places where four or five live, but we really only got back there about 7 8 years ago. It was it was actually quite dire for a while. So where where we can attract our local residents from around the neighborhood as well as tourism related things, but we need two or three things, you know, an event center, you know, will give you 75, 100 nights busy, but there, there needs to be other, other things, right? And it, and it can't all just be, you know, national museums that you, you know, you take your friend, you're visiting friends to once in a while. We need fun and exciting things, you know, whether it's concert venues, theaters, we need more and more of that stuff downtown. And and those are actually could be easy wins. So I, I do think it's it's important, whatever they are, whether it's an event center or whatever it is, we just need two, three things that start bringing people downtown on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Lisa, I think we could do this uh, weekly. And I have <laughs> this discussion and I, I think it's a very healthy one to continue momentum and continue a focus on this topic. But unfortunately, we've run out of time for you, Sue Ling and Neil. So I want to thank you very much for joining us today. Um, I want to wish you uh, continued success in these discussions. It's complex, but I think we've got the right people on the job. So thanks for, thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Michael. Thanks for having us.
All right, we're going to move on to uh, part two of uh, today's show, and it examines a little bit of the real estate, particularly from a commercial uh, perspective. And once again, we've got uh, two great guests uh, joining us here today, R real experts, in fact. Our first guest, I was looking up, up on uh, LinkedIn just to check a figure. He has almost 30 years experience working in uh, commercial real estate. Let's bring him on uh, screen now. Uh, here is Jeff Brown, the Associate Vice President and Broker at Collier's Ottawa. Hey, Jeff. Hey, thanks for having me. Oh, I am excited to get into this with you and welcome back. We're gonna bring Jillian uh, Oxley Harper, of course, from Pure Vision back on screen. I uh, hope you enjoyed that uh, that discussion and there's still lots to talk about here, Jeff. Um, I think where I wanted to start off, Jeff, and I and I don't like, I, I, I really am cautious about using these, these negative statistics and not throwing them around too much. But if I understand correctly, a recent, um, a recent update on uh, on commercial space in downtown Ottawa indicated that we're almost at 14% vacant office space. Uh, and that, as I understand it, Jeff, is an all-time record for the city. So uh, we're, we're going we're gonna to get a little bit more optimistic here, but let's just realize, Jeff, like that's a problem, right? Oh, well, absolutely. I mean, if you look at pre-COVID, we were running at 5% uh, five for, five for Class A downtown, around 10%. Things were trending down. Uh, uh, pressure on rental rates was going up, which is not great for tenants, but it does prompt uh, interest in, in new construction activity. And we actually did see a new building come up in, in Zibi. So yeah. so that was, that was all positive. But the challenge was when COVID hit, everything stopped. And um, again, I'm, I'm an office leasing guy, so obviously I'm a little biased that way. But uh, you know, what we saw was, uh, you know, a trickle of sublease opportunities start to hit the market as tenants realize they don't need the, they don't need as much space kind of going forward. That translated into increased direct vacancies as these tenants kind of moved away from their office lease, realizing they don't need the space and they could, they're better off saving, saving the money. So, um, you know, it, it's a very, very challenging time right now. Um, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a matter where there's so much uncertainty from a tenant's perspective in terms of what this whole hybrid model is going to look like. How much space do I need? Do I need space? What do I, what am I going to do? I mean, everything is kind of just slowed right down because of that. Yeah, I agree, Jeff. And again, I'm not going to dwell on the negative here, but I, I will point out that, you know, based on my understanding of the situation, of course, there are still many businesses locating offices, locating downtown that that leases haven't come due since the pandemic. So not only are we at like 14 percent vacancy, but it's possible we this might get worse for months, uh, maybe even like a year or two years before we see a stabilization. Is is that kind of an accurate statement, Jeff? I would say that, uh, yeah, I mean, unfortunately, again, just given given the uncertainty, I think it's going to be about three to five years before we have any real clarity in terms of how our downtown is going to end up from a from a vacancy perspective. Um, I do think, you know, again, we've kind of hit a bit of a double double whammy. We've got the kind of indecisiveness by the federal government in terms of the whole back to back to the office mandate. Um, tech has been hit really hard by by the by this whole thing where you know, pre-COVID, we had a really nice kind of uh, tech hub developing in the downtown, kind of led by by Shopify and SurveyMonkey. And and now, you know, Shopify has put a lot of their space on, on the market. There's other tech companies kind of doing the same within the downtown. Plus, you get all those, you know, smaller, smaller companies, the NGOs and whatnot that, you know what, they, they don't need an office. They're, they're, they're very comfortable and highly productive working from working from home. So... Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's going to be a little bit challenging over, over the next little while. But again, you know, it creates opportunities, right? Yeah. Um, and I think for the proactive landlords and for those tenants that are that are kind of thinking ahead, there there are opportunities out there. Great, great segue. And Jillian, we're going to bring you into the conversation here in a minute. But let's talk about those opportunities, Jeff. So it's it's not all dread. Um, there are investments being made uh, by private sector landlords uh, in in some of the top top buildings in downtown Ottawa. Maybe you can walk us through a few of those. What you've seen, uh, Jeff? Yeah. Well, I think if, if you look from a high end, the leasing activity has not stopped. There has been a a move to quality, and I know sometimes people talk about a flight to quality, but in, right now nothing is moving quickly. There's a move to quality. Those, those tenants that are active in the market, choosing to relocate, are moving to 
better office buildings, buildings with amenities, not, not only amenities within the building, but, uh, but outside of the building. So a good example is, uh, these are pictures of uh, Constitution Square. They've just basically gone through a major multi-million dollar renovation to their retail concourse, trying to move away from more of the formal institutional lobby to a more of a people place. Uh, this is a picture of what the World Exchange Plaza is going through with, with their complex. Major, major $30 million renovation to their two-story retail concourse to make it, again, more of a, more of a people place. And uh, I want to read something, actually, that uh, it was from some propaganda. It's not propaganda. That's not a nice way to say it, but, but yeah. promotional, promotional material from the World Exchange Plaza, which I, I think you could apply to all of these. So what they're trying to do, they're trying to create a modernized, all day people place, work, meet, dine, gather, connect and engage in others in an environment that uh, inspires the countless possibilities, opportunities and unexpected delights of every day. Again, you know, the office is just not about the office anymore. It's what else can you do while you're at the office? It's the building. So uh, ideally you could go down, maybe you do some shopping, you, you do a business lunch. It, it's, a, it's a lot more than, than just the office. The office is changing and, and Jillian would can certainly cover off that. But again, it's what's what's outside, what's outside the office. This is a picture of uh, Sun Life Financial Center. They were kind of the first to kick it off. They finished their renovations prior to COVID, um, and again, making it up, making it a people place. You know, ma making it a place where you can grab a coffee, you have a place to sit, you can chat with colleagues. There's the opportunity for casual collisions with 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 colleagues or, or from my business competitors or with landlords i mean that that's what we're looking for that that's the beauty of of the downtown you know keep in mind that 40 percent of our our competitive office market is located within the downtown so it's important that uh you know we we get uh, we get this maybe outside of the box thinking by these proactive landlords to to entice you know tenants back or to remain in the downtown yeah, and and this is kind of what we were talking with Su Ling and Neil that it's important to maintain some sort of um, uh, momentum, create a sense of momentum. And when I think of Constitution Square, when I think of Sun Life Financial Center, and when I think of the uh, renovations going on at World Exchange Plaza, we're quite literally talking about tens of millions of dollars that are being invested to create. I like thinking of it as people magnets, and I'm gonna on that point, Jillian, come back to you. Um, in, in a lot of the uh, these live uh, broadcasts that we've done, we've talked about the need to create an experience. In those past episodes, Jillian, we talked about experience within an office, but as Jeff has just so uh, aptly showed us here, uh, it's bigger than that, isn't it? It's, it yeah. it's, it's a building, it's a neighborhood. Absolutely, and it's fun fact, we actually furnished that lobby at Constitution Square um, last year where that wonderfully successful Ottawa is open for business event was held. Beautiful space, very welcoming, different areas for people to sit, large open areas, uh, quieter little nook corners where you can go and have a quiet coffee and an and a impromptu meeting with someone. So we're really seeing that investment. Three of our largest, most recent projects were actually tenants moving into the World Exchange Plaza. So those tenants that are choosing to invest in creating spaces where people want to be are going to actually encourage people, to Jeff's point, to either stay to take on a sublet or to renew their leases. So it's really, it's, it's, it's from the bottom, and I say the bottom meaning the lobby, up on all the floors as well that we have to have this methodology and this idea to go in and make these spaces, rethink them so that people really want to be there. Yeah, and it, it is a little bit, uh, Jeff, I'll come back to you. you. You must be hearing this from some of the tenants uh, that are looking to lease space downtown. It is about creating this experience, right? Like, let's just dig into that a little bit more. So it's not about mandating people back into the office a certain number of days a week, although that might be a reality for, for some organizations, uh, both private and public sector, but it's more like an creating the incentive. Is that right, Jeff? Yeah. Um... Not that I'm an I'm an expert, but I almost think there's been a bit a bit of a shift in the power dynamic from from the employer to the employee. Now this is not across the board, but I think uh, a lot of uh, employers are very very sensitive to that, and they don't want a mandate. Um, they want to maybe create have the office be a magnet, how to attract the employee back back to to the office as opposed to a just across the board mandate, which I don't think is going to be successful, and and will push away push away some 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 employees, and and I think. By them, by them doing that, by being flexible. Again, hybrid is is a wonderful model. 
there, there's there's no reason in the world someone should sit in their car for three hours on a snowy winter day trying to get back downtown when they can be just as productive, you know, working where they are. But I also think, you know, again, from from a collaboration perspective, from from a human interaction, um, you know, I, I think it's good to get outside of the office. I mean, I was a good citizen. I I survived for about six, seven weeks at home when COVID first happened. I had to go into the office. I just needed I needed a journey, and then I had seven thousand square feet to myself. Um, <laughs> so, so it's it's nice now that you know we are seeing some some more activity in the downtown. I think the latest stat is we're, we're I mean Ottawa's still lagging behind all major metropolitan cities, but we're at about fifty one percent, and I would suggest that fifty one percent is Tuesday to Thursday. <laughs> Absolutely, um, but. Uh, but you know what? I think it, it's it's slowly, slowly moving forward. And and again, I'm, you know, very, very. I try to be very optimistic. You know, the the, the glass half full. And I, and I keep kind of, you know, last last September, I thought we'd see dramatic changes with people coming back to work. That didn't happen. I'm kind of hoping now for for this September. Um, but again, I I do think it's going to be a longer term uh, program. And I do think, again, it's it's the status quo. The former status quo is not going to work going forward. You know. Uh, landlords and employers need to rethink their space. Where are they going to be? How can they attract those those employees to the office without mandating them? It's it's that new vision. It's a it's a vision for the downtown. It's a vision for a building, and it's a vision for uh, mm-hmm. for an office. Uh, Jeff, I, again, I'm, I'm going to repeat what I said to Sue Sue Ling and Neil that I wish we had more time to talk. We're at risk of uh, running a little bit uh, long here, so I want to thank you, uh, Jeff, for bringing. I think it's 28 years of experience and uh, sharing that with us today. We do really appreciate your participation. Thank you for having me. All right, we're uh, uh, goodbye. That's uh, again, uh, uh, Jeff, uh, a longtime uh, leader in the commercial real estate place. Uh, Jillian, we'll start wrapping up here. Before we do, I got a question to ask you. I just want to give a shout out to some of the people uh, that have been participating and some of the comments they've been sharing. Uh, Larry, uh, Lori uh, Alphonse is reminding us that accessibility is important. Inc- inclusivity is an in- important driver. I love that point. Um, Here's uh, uh, someone by the name of Basil talking about uh, it's wise to think about building, renovating buildings to be smarter, healthier, and more sustainable. So thinking about uh, accessibility, thinking about inclusion, thinking about um, the the, uh, environmental uh, concerns. And then I thought this was an interesting comment. Thank you, uh, Zicky, for sharing this. That again, he's, he's advocating for more people living downtown. So... Uh, you know, make sure that we're not simply workers uh, commuting back and forth uh, to the suburbs. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, Jillian, we're going to we're going to come uh, back to you in the uh, here in a minute to uh, talk about a really um, exciting development uh, with uh, Bureau Vision. Uh, Bureau Vision is not simply talking about uh, the downtown core. Bureau Vision uh, is, in fact, uh, looking to uh, to make a significant investment about making investments in downtown. And Bureau Vision, uh, share the news with us here, Jillian. Yeah, so sorry, I, I'm not quite sure what happened. Um, I could hear you. I just had this black yeah. screen. I was going, okay, come on, you can add lib this year. That's okay. Goes in. You're back so now. We fly through of the podium. Um, and then the podium, the current space we're in right now, we are actually tripling it. We are tripling our space in downtown Ottawa. We're taking over the entire um, Spark Street facing floor of um, the podium building on the second floor. This is a fly through that was created by one of our very talented design team in Montreal. So this is what we're going to. And you will see in a very few seconds where we're at right now. So Okay. Yeah, we, we are, saw some construction uh, we images are, we are there. Under construction there. In, um, in Spark Street. There you go. Um, there, fall this I can year. almost imagine people swinging hammers here. <laughs> <laughs> no, drilling, swinging hammers. You think I have a little bit of an echo here? This is why I'm not downtown right now. It's yeah, yeah. Completely gutted. Um, and our goal, you know, we've done these webinars with all of you on creating workspaces, tips for transforming, and. We really are applying, you know, what we preach, what we believe into our own space, where we're coming in and there's this beautiful pavilion area where people can meet, have a touchdown meeting, have a coffee, bring in a customer into the space that's delineated with interesting visuals of shelving, 
of, of green space, of, of wood, of natural fibers, a lot of texture, a lot of accessibility to seeing things, beautiful artwork on the walls, color, pieces of interest, collaborative areas, privacy pods. You may remember I talked to you about Zoom rooms way back at the beginning, um, areas right. where we can present and spread out and strategize quieter, more traditional meeting rooms. So really a space that we are investing in to bring not only our team, but our customers and our industry partners to where they can work and thrive, be productive and where they want to be. So we're going to look excellent. forward to welcoming everyone to our new, largely expanded space in late September of this year. So yeah. we truly, and, and truly are looking forward to being back downtown. Absolutely. And just to underline, you know, what we're talking about here, this, this will really be an inspirational place. So if you're a company or if you're an organization looking to re-engage your employees in terms of space and, and finding that experience that will draw them back to the office, I can just imagine, uh, Jillian, this is going to be a, a place of inspiration. And I should point out this kind of like tie a little ribbon in this, that um, we're going to be launching the 2023-2024 uh, Best Auto Offices magazine in that space. So uh, if you're interested, please uh, please stay tuned. We're excited because that'll be our first your first live event of that uh, Best Offices since 2019. That is exactly it. That is exactly it. To kick it off and yeah. uh, we I know all of us here at, at Bureau Vision are just tremendously excited and I think I have to say a little impatient to. To okay. Finish, to get back town. Everyone's yeah. always a little impatient with renovations. Yeah. That's yeah. that's par for the course. Our customers are going through, so it's okay. Yeah, that's par, for, par for the course. So, Jillian, I want to thank you again, uh, not only for supporting this podcast over the past couple of years, but also having the inspiration for today's uh, topic, right? Which is really to to uh, zoom out and talk about the entire future of downtown. Absolutely. Thank you, Michael. Appreciate it. All right, so we'll bid uh, Jillian uh, adieu and we'll get into our final uh, send off here. Uh, I want to thank everyone that participated today, uh, Suling, Neil, uh, Jeff, and uh, also Jillian. Uh, I want to remind everyone that if you're interested in continuing to pursue this issue, there's a great um, a great digital destination for this. And you can go to our website at obj.ca. This is a topic at OBJ that we take uh, very seriously. We're putting a lot of resources into reporting uh, on this and other real estate stories. So I recommend that you visit the website obj.ca. We've got a great uh, weekday email newsletter called OBJ Today. Many of the city's top business and political leaders look at that email to scan through it and get the top stories of the day. Of course, you can social find us on social media. Our LinkedIn just eclipsed 30,000 followers, by the way. And since a lot of you are here on YouTube, I wanna ask you to click the like button, the red subscribe button, and uh, if you click the little bell, you get notified when we're uh, online. So that brings us to uh, the end of today, uh, bringing life back to downtown Ottawa. Hope you've uh, learned a lot. Let's continue this discussion and make sure this issue stays in the forefront for both the uh, political and business leaders. Thank you uh, for uh, tuning in today. On behalf of the bigger crew at OBJ, I'm Michael Curran signing off for today. See you soon. Bye-bye.